Um, so thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, why a Canadian? Uh, now, we're supposedly very nice people, despite <laughs> the fact that we participated in burning Washington to the ground in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. Why do we have all these Canadians appearing at conferences, really of worldwide stature, many of them have been referred to in previous presentations. Why do we have a robust body of law in Canada? Some of the, the deepest insights into parental alienation comes from Canadian jurisprudence. Is it because we have pulled the wool over the world's eyes and we're really not such nice people after all? Do we have a disproportionate body of alienators in or does it just happen to be that by happenstance, we've had some really good clinicians working with some insightful lawyers in an environment where it is typical that our trial level decisions are quite lengthy and quite detailed. And certain other aspects of the Canadian jurisprudence and legal system that I'm going to touch upon that lend themselves to solutions in legal cases. I'm not aware of any empirical work showing that we solve more cases necessarily, but there's a developing body of jurisprudence on the back end of protective separation cases where the aligned parent is hoping to move themselves back in and you start to get some insight into did the structural intervention work, how robust was the solution, do we now have resilient children? Did it take a formal program, such as Kathleen Ray's or Family Bridges or any of the other recognized programs, or was the structural intervention itself sufficient? And that body of case law, what happens on the back end, will continue to grow. Now, children's <coughs> evidence in PA cases is, is a vexing issue. We struggle with it in every case. We struggle with it regardless of the modality through which their voices are heard by the court. So while the original concept for this paper that Enos and I discussed focused on judicial interviews, as you'll see shortly, of all the modalities, that is the one most frowned upon, and we're going to examine why. And there are many other modalities modalities that are more robust, but regardless of how what the children say and what the children do, what the children mean gets to the court, it's subject to the same difficulties, the same rules of evidence, and the same misconceptions on the part of those conveying that evidence to the court and the court receiving that evidence. So it's important to understand regardless of the root, the fundamentals of evidence law, fundamentals of what is the knowledge base of the person conveying their first-hand experience with the children, and what is the knowledge base of the court receiving that data is universal. So the focus is going to be on a judge interviewing the children in the time that allows this presentation goes much broader and tries to tackle the voice of the child generally, and you'll all get it along with whole bunch of other research materials. But it's important to understand, even without a judicial interview, because they're relatively <coughs> infrequent, the same paradox apply. So this joke has already been made by several of the other speakers. If I had way more time, this is what we would try and cover. But I'm going to try and cover as much as possible. At my level, the slides are dense. It almost reads like a paper, and you'll all have this sent to you and posted as well. Everybody likes party favors. All of our kids, when they leave the parties, it was always great. So you guys get a, a lot of party favors here. This will all be posted. So obviously the case law is Canadian case law. And it's primarily going to be oriented toward Ontario because that's where I practice. Canada is very, very open. Another reason why we have a lot of case law developing we're quite open to receiving case 
law from other provinces. So in any one of our cases, you get to deploy an awful lot of knowledge. That being said, the entire country has a smaller population and likely a smaller economy than California. So the hope is that through these types of venues, we're reaching out to a much um, larger body of people who can take advantage if they're open to Canadian jurisprudence in the same way that they're open to Canadian peer review uh, articles and our experts who speak at conferences. Aside from the statements of law themselves, uh, where if you were to pick out the keywords in the decisions that are quoted, and run them through the typical search engines in the U.S. law database, you'll find helpful law. So what are Canadian judges saying and how are they saying it should be applicable in other jurisdictions as well. But you'll see some interesting uh, terms in the presentation, and I have other statements of law that I'm eventually going to be posting on the website. So for example, there's a fairly robust body of law on enmeshment. Enmeshment often presents like a PA case, but it's not a PA case, and the court is struggling. This, you keep using parental alienation. The children state they love their mother, but yet they're not coming. Or they have difficulty transitioning, or there's anxiety projection. It looks the same, but it's actually enmeshed. Or it looks the same, and it is anxiety projection. So the courts don't have the ability to make that sort of distinguishing analysis. But yet there's case law, cases that have turned on enmeshment, cases that have turned on anxiety projection. So think outside the box rather than just parental alienation and looking at cases where parental alienation was found. And think about all the manifestations of maladaptive behavior after separation. And because we have search engines and all the case databases, you'll find what you need. Now, some other interesting things in the handouts. A lot of these cases turn not on PA, but on parenting, on the assessment of both parents' parenting. And just as judges often don't have the background that all of you have in this sort of discourse, they don't have the type of background that a master's of education or somebody with you know, a professor at a university in the faculty of child studies would have on parenting. So is there a science to parenting? Of course there's a science to parenting. And if you were to write the word parenting or good parenting, anything like that through Amazon, looking for books, or get a plug to our version, Indigo, um, Last time I did it on Amazon, I got 135,000 hits. There's a lot of people, way more people writing on parenting than they are writing on PA. And these cases will turn on an assessment of parenting. So the comment has already been made that maybe we're doing ourselves a disservice by using the label and then formatting and running the whole case for a given structural model that we know is scientifically consistent when we can prove those factors in the case, and yet the judge not being versed in that is actually going to decide the case based on the judge's subjective, not objective, because they don't have training in parenting, assessment of the favored parent's parenting and the targeted parent's parenting. So why not the science of parenting? Well, the parenting uh, list is 20 pages long, covers all the major chapters and specialties of parenting. I've been through all of these books, obviously I've not read every page of every book, but I can definitely say that this library, if you will, is worth perusing and using in this sort of case. Okay, so the who, what, when, where, why, because as I said, however the modality of the children's voice getting to the court, it has to, it's one of the recognized criteria in the custody and access case. Judicial interviews are universally frowned on, we're going to see why and they're subject to the same vagaries of any other modality. But what is it we're dealing with? Well, who, what children, what body of children's voice is heard? Obviously, a lot goes based on age. However, if there are other complicating factors like autism, whatever, we will put the cautionary note of how, quote, young the child is 
in, in light, in that prism of their, their special needs, etc., and the, the cognitive ability of a child for in general. Um, now, unfortunately, our age ranges are way off. So there's a ton of jurisprudence developed over time that the views of a preteen and teen are subject to substantial weight um, and worthy of way more weight than a young child. Answer incorrect. That's what the jurisprudence says. But it's several decades of social science research out of date. So we know for a fact, because of neuroscience and developments over the last 10 years, that the teen brain doesn't mature until 24 and a half, and that the last part of it is the most important part. So why are we putting such weight on the views and preferences of a 13 and 14 year old and giving up on a 16 year old because they're so close to 18? Um, it, it, in recent years, is headed in the wrong direction, but neuroscience is telling us it should be heading in the opposite direction. So we need more neuroscience in our cases. What are we asking about the children's voice? Just their views and preferences as to their schedule? Or are we probing for the rationale? Dr. Warren Klein gave us real good insight into some of the questions about probing their express views and preferences rather than just accepting them slavishly. Too many cases just accept them slavishly. So it appears to be their independent views. Really? On what basis? They didn't blink when they were saying it? Or have you probed in a very subtle way, in a permitted way, in, in a non-suggestive way, to really get at the root of the preferences and where they're coming from? Or how about alternatives? I understand you want to live with dads. And that's because he's in support of you playing hockey. I had an actual case on this very point. He thinks, despite the fact you're getting C's in school, you should play rep hockey. It's the OMH game, uh, which is the league uh, broadly scrap and draw. Uh, and that's five days a week. And your mom is really concerned about that. She thinks you should play at the rep level, which is one up from the committee level. It's still good. That's a twice a week you're doing. And so it was obvious where the child's views and preferences were coming from. And the Office of the Children's Lawyer, which is the largest publicly funded child representation infrastructure in North America, they accept about half of the cases referred to them. Actually, their lawyer and their social worker sided with the dad that the child should have what they want, they're all in favor. So the answer to that is you've got to be kidding me. Is that the system we have today? How disappointing. So if you probe, you can make a much better decision on best interest. It may turn out to just be a preference for red hockey. What about probing further? What about the factual assertions on which the feelings are based and the feelings then leading to an expressed preference? What if the factual assertions are wrong? As we've heard throughout the conference, uh, no, you really weren't abused. Uh, no, your mother's parenting, despite it not being your preference, is fully normative, so you weren't abused. So if the preference is based on a subjective understanding that my mom is abusive, well, that's wrong and that preference shouldn't be followed. What about when? When in the case we receive, we receive the child's at least stated views in this deeper analytical framework? If it's too late in the case, you've given up the opportunity to cross-examine many of the people who've come through the case to testify. So you want to make sure that everybody knows that in advance, which leads to the next point. A lot of the sources, the typical sources of the child's knowledge, understanding, feelings, views, preferences, are contained in the files and positions of all the third parties who are dragged into these cases. So children's lawyer, the child protection authorities, the police, the family therapist, the parental coordinator, all of whom are going to come and testify. Well, you need their files so you can understand what the children were saying to them before they commence the trial. And so if you're not smart about when you get that disclosure and give yourself enough time to go through it and decipher their handwriting, um, then what are they going to do? Show up on day four of the trial? with their file, 
It's far too, you can't go through it. And we lost the opportunity. So what if the parental board meter is all on dad's side? But then when you read the file, you see what the children were saying, and it's completely incongruous to everything else that every other player, including the parents, know. That's, that's an obvious line of inquiry, but if you didn't get that well in advance, uh, then you know, we've lost that opportunity. So why are we even bothering? This is an adult decision. We don't need this. Custody access disputes in terms of a legal framework, simply stated, are assess the child's needs, interests, wants, what they'd like to do, who are they, um, what, are, what stage of development are they at. You haven't raised the issue of where you want to live. And then go back to the parents and say, what are the abilities, willingness, attitude, aptitude, knowledge of the parents in meeting those specific needs? And if they're normative, different parenting styles, different attitudes, one's a bit more permissive, one's a bit more structured. The structured parent, by the way, even if fully normative, loses every time, right? Child's preferences, I call it a race to the bottom of permissive parenting. <laughs> And it evolves in the course of the case. Oh, you want to stay till 1 a.m.? That's no problem. And just remember what to say to the children. <laughs> okay. um, so why are we even bothered? Well, unfortunately, it's a, it's a feature of most statutes, not all. And it's a feature here, but not in the way the anti-PA body says. All the convention does is tell its member states, you must craft legislation with a view to the right of the child to maintain a relationship with their parents and give the child some input into that. Not the right of the child to choose as between parents. So it's a common, everybody says, oh, Article 12, the child gets a choice. No, 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 no. The child has the right to a relationship with both parents. And then the implementing legislation, in accordance with each country's obligations in subscribing to the convention, is allowed to put in the caveat that almost all have, if they can be reliably ascertained. And there is the hook for lawyers representing clients being estranged from their children. If they can be reliably ascertained, it's in the implementing legislation in every jurisdiction, and it's totally permitted under the convention. So federally in Canada, there's not a mention of the child's views and preferences in finding best interests. There's only two factors in our federal legislation, and that includes the maximum contact principle and the friendly parent principle, both of which are very friendly to our understanding of children's best interests. Provincially, however, we have in each province different models. Ontario has eight factors. It's non-exclusive, as, as it should be. One of them happens to be the children's views and preferences, if they can be reliably ascertained. And the federal paradigm, it's kind of like overlapping jurisdiction, of maximum contact and friendly parent is import, imported through jurisprudence into the provincial realm, which would cover <coughs> non on the flip side in Canada, we have no constitutional right to parent. You can make a very somewhat tangential argument under our Charter of Rights, but the Supreme Court of Canada has said that access is the right of the child, and it's always looking at it from the child's point of view. So even that might use a freshening up in light of the overwhelming body of social science knowledge today Children benefit after separation by having two primary homes, not one home or place you will visit. Okay, so the challenge, yes. In the states, uh, in the 50 US states mm -hmm. uh, that are governed by federal law, the, the parents have a constitutional right, it is a fundamental right to parent their children. The children have a fundamental right to their relationship with their parent. They have two interacting rights. Thirdly, 
there is a fundamental right to family relations, which is a third interacting right. Okay, that's very helpful. Theoretically, therefore, we have more to work with here in the States, but I'd still say that our law on remedies and diagnosis is so far ahead for some of the infrastructure reasons I mentioned. Now, assessing the children's views and preferences, even before you get to those deeper levels of child understanding and testimony, is complicated because it, all of these factors have to be forefront in your mind. It's colored. They're victims. They're fragile. There's power and control dynamics going on. There's identification with the aggressor going on. Um, one parent is going to grill them before and after every meeting with the children's council. The other parent is taking a, a, a more gracious attitude toward that. Who will usually lose as a result. So, do judges anybody else, assessors, therapists, credit coordinators, really understand the complexity of understanding the child's narrative? Well, I would say unless they're prepared to come to these sorts of specialized ventures, um, they're probably not going to bring to the table everything they need to know. Now, sometimes the child's voice comes to the court through a rather circuitous view, route that looks reliable because at the end of the day, all the judge sees is four child protection, Canada, we call them children's aid societies, four child protection workers testify that the child said this, or it's their understanding that this or that happened in the family. So you need, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion. Well, where is this from? And do you have first hand knowledge? And if, if not, who did you hear it from? Who did they hear it from? And how has the story morphed along the way? Has it, has it taken on a life of its own? Many of the allegations against the target parent sound credible because they, they will often have that little kernel of truth. You know, you were upset. That, were you upset? Oh, I was upset that day. Yes. Okay, well then, the rest of this saga must have happened. No, they just saw the nugget on which to build their whole false narrative. So when you trace back the source of children's evidence, even though at the end of the day, as we'll see under evidence law, yes, it can be a permitted exception to the hearsay rule to have a CS worker come and testify as to their notes. Their notes are otherwise admissible as business records, but not for the truth of their content. So again, in evidence law, there's a slide later on about evidence law, Third-party records, even if admitted on consent, can only stand for the fact that what happened, what captured, what was captured there, was captured by a legitimate child protection worker on that day and written down within 24 hours in accordance with their standards. Meaning that child protection worker experienced the statement in this way, but the truth of the the truth underlying the factual assertions therein cannot be ascertained without having the caseworker come and testify and be cross-examined so that the weaknesses in what they're putting forward can be explored. And so that difference between the surface and what the truth is pervades the difficulties with child's evidence. It's a fundamental principle of evidence law generally, but it takes on a heightened importance in these cases where quite often the court will say, a pox on both houses, uh, you've made mistakes and I don't like you, and you've made mistakes and I don't, but the child is always pure, innocent, they're the victim, I believe everything they say, and it's a false paradigm. Courts assess the credibility of litigants all the time. The courts, courts have to, and there are standardized lists of criteria. One of the statements of law handouts is a nice succinct statement of what the law of credibility is in Canada. But you don't see courts apply some of this sort of thinking. You can see here's some when I present about actually conducting a case, I go at length about how to attack the credibility of the aligned parent. Um, but you don't see this depth of analysis applying all the law of credibility to the child statements because after all, child and vulnerable, they're almost truthful, and they're sweet and they're nice, and they 
I don't have to apply that same rigor to the evidence I'm receiving or what they're saying and doing. And that's wrong. So, a um, little plug here for Ray Dalio, one of the world's largest investment fund managers with a long, long, long track record of success through multiple markets. Uh, brilliant man. And he was quoted in this magazine, in this article in Fortune magazine, in this way. The intolerance for the inadequate or superficial answer. Um, he has just published a book akin to the essays of Warren Buffett. It's everything he would like to pass on to the rest of the world that he's done so well with. It's called Principles, Life, and Work by Ray Dalio. And I bought multiple copies, I've sent it to all my family members. The insights there are timeless from a truly brilliant man. So the jurisprudence that you'll see goes through lists of what we look at and all the common misconceptions that, that the strength of a belief is somehow tied to the credibility of the assertion. Wrong. Or that another chestnut is, well, the, the child was consistent throughout the case. That just means that the programming was done early on and the fact that they said the same thing to child protection and the police doesn't mean that the sexual abuse occurred. So you find common mis conceptions in applying standard principles of evidence law, particularly glaringly in these cases. So here's a reference to the reading list. Now, since we are assessing parenting, highly judgmentally, I would add, it's important to know what parenting is. And it's actually a very disparate body of knowledge. Um, surprisingly hard to find. Like, can I get a graduate level textbook, at least a real solid, well-known university textbook called something like Parenting 15th Edition. That's what I'm really looking for. And um, maybe three or four in all of the 135,000 kids on Amazon. Someone who's been around long enough, and usually it's in the second or third hand professors by the time it gets that far. But they are there, and they're referenced on the handout. So, neuroscience. When it gets down to the level of books designed for the lay person, particularly, I mean, there's two other well known books for the lay person on adolescents who give us probably the most difficult problems in these cases. You have to understand the adolescent mind, you have to understand the changes happening in the brain, you have to understand neural pruning. All of this. You have to understand what living in an invalidating environment does to anybody's brain, let alone a child. So we used to question, like, how can it be? He just said to his mother, you never took me to Disney World. What are you talking about? So he's how the child's clearly lying. And then over time, we started to discover, because of neural pruning, having favorable thoughts of a parent, living within almost you know, primarily or almost exclusively in a validating environment, the preteen and teen brain cannot tolerate two parallel, inconsistent internal working models of a person. And the only way to resolve it is to pick one. It's, it's almost like a, 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 a projection of splitting into the neuroscience world. So they resolve either that the other parent is all good or all bad because they're, the younger child's brain seems to be able to handle two different worlds. Preteen, teen, no. So it gets resolved and the older memories are starting to be pruned because our brains are prediction engines that are always updated for the latest information to be primed for the experience we're about to see. Well, if you understand that truism about neuroscience, then it puts quite a perspective on a PA case in terms of urgency and suggestibility. And then how about memory? So the way memory works, of course, is the exact opposite of iTunes. I could recall a favorite song a thousand times, and then be saved back in ident bit, bit for bit in identical form. Memory is the exact opposite. It never gets resaved in exactly the form that it was before. 
because our brains are experience engines and predictive engines and uh, kind of uh, visual engines as opposed to text and bit rates. So you recall an older memory into a current internal work environment, it gets colored by it, and that sets the new bar for your view of a person or a situation. So once you under understand that, how are you going to approach a PA case? Judges, assessors, therapists, PCs, they don't understand this. A another thing that I'll just mention, trauma, what is the effect of trauma on the brain? That needs to be studied. I mean, it is studied, but it needs to be studied with application here. Okay, thankfully, I can be brief about the jurisprudence. There is an overwhelming body of law, if you know the search terms, and you build upon some of the case I'm giving you, which is quite, quite extensive. You won't have to work hard to find cases saying, I'm discounting the views of the child out of concern for whatever the term is that you're serving. Coaching, projection, uh, manipulation, on and on, no shortage of cases. So it's just well accepted. You have cases saying, you know, we should usually put a lot of weight on this 14 or 15 year old child, uh, except where it's warranted not to. One of the situations is a PA case. So it's not even debatable. So if you don't go to court armed with this readily available body of law, you, you just you shouldn't be litigating this type of case. Okay, I mentioned methods, and talk today doesn't allow me to go through every method, and I'm focusing on the judicial interventions in family. But understand that every time you introduce another modality, and another round of interviews, you're, of course, programming the child's mind. You get asked a hundred times, did your dad ever do anything that you were uncomfortable about? At some point, you start to believe that people are asking the question because they're worried about something, and then that leads you to adopt the other side's narrative. When I speak generally about how to conduct a PA case, I start with a broad-based difficulty to be fair, frankly, to our judges. They have to with completely conflicting narratives. Okay, the sky is blue versus the sky is pink. They have to deal with missing narratives because a lot of the cases have self reps okay, at least half. They have to do with confused narratives from third parties who are unwitting dupes or dealers of the alienation. And then they have to deal with their own bias is perhaps I'm searching for what word, it is perhaps too strong a word, but just they come with their own constructs, their own background, their own training, their own knowledge for how they're going to deal with these very difficult cases where, where it, there's just this huge gap in the narratives and somehow they have the responsibility and it is a weighty responsibility, given that we're dealing with children, to figure it out. So what are the odds? Finding a judge with the level of knowledge of the people in this room. Not high. So, it's a cautionary note. Even today, despite all our jurisprudence and all this knowledge, if we're being feared by our clients, we sometimes have to say, I'll walk this walk with you. I will go down this path and I won't abandon you at the end. But still, the preponderance of these cases don't end well. You should know that if you're going to stay the court course and exhibit the requisite degree of resilience. But for the rest of your life, you'll at least know you tried. Our collective shame, if you will, what I call an embarrassment in the civilized society, is that I'm making this statement in 2017 when we really know what the answers are. Okay, there are certain advantages to the judge actually meeting the children. Instead of just getting it all indirectly, they develop an intimate uh, understanding of Detective Smith and senior CAS caseworker Jones and the parents. But the subject matter of all of this is just some, they may get some pictures, you know, quite often we're putting in pictures to Mike's point about establishing bonded relations before all of this fell apart. Here's all the happy, joyous pictures and then 
in the interludes where we were successful in getting a mini reconciliation. Here's a look at that. It's like flicking a switch. Many of us use the term like flicking a switch. Here they are, more happy pictures. So they'll see pictures of the kids, but they won't get to know the kids. And we heard from one of our speakers that 90% um, of communication is nonverbal. And all they get is the report that the child said this to this person on this day in this set of circumstances. It helps. They can assess how the child is saying it. That assumes that they're trained. They're certainly not trained to spot a lie, but they're a human being and an experienced human being, and usually a mature human being, which they're young. I guess, I guess at this stage of my life, I'm starting to see all these young judges being appointed. And it's hopeful that the next generation will come with a body of experience that, that may help. So there, there, there is some upside, but it is far overweighed by the downside. So let's think about what's happening here. Let's say the judge has attended this lecture and says, no, Fletcher's right. I can't just ask them what their preferences are. I've got to dig. Well, you've now abandoned the adjudicator. You're doing your own investigation. There is no way in the world you're going to be able to take the results of your own investigation and park it and assess the evidence as, as a whole. It, it's not what the trier of fact is supposed to do. You're not a psychologist. You can't test the child's critical thinking skills generally. You're not allowed to, but what you're doing could corrupt the requisite analytical process for an adjudicator. You certainly don't have the training. You wouldn't know what a loyalty bond looks like. And you're certainly not going to put the children on the stand so that the parents can then cross-examine the children on what they say to the judge. Can you imagine the alienating parent if the child said to the judge, I really do want to see my mom, but my dad won't let me. Well, their lawyer may really want to probe that bit, but the child's not going to be exposed to cross-examination. So the whole process, you know, one could argue that a civil litigation construct, which is how we resolve family law, is the wrong form to start with for resolving any family law case, let alone these. But once you're in that form, you have to respect the rules in the form. It's an adjudicated rule, not an investigative rule, etc. Then what about all the other speakers? What about my buddy Steve? his paper on cognitive biases. How many judges even understand what the term means so that they can guard themselves against it? Not too many. So again, no matter what modality, the voice of the child, and then as I said before, what voice of the child, how deep are you probing, gets to the court, all of these issues are relevant. A judicial interview has multiple levels of additional potential problems. Hence, it is the modality of the last resort where it's for some fluky reason, there aren't a lot of third parties involved, no police involved, no nothing, and the only way the child's voice gets into the court is through the parents, and you run headlong into hearsay issues, then so long as it's just a touch base, there would be a rule certainly for a judicial interview. Um, thankfully, the case law, and in Ontario we have some guidelines, uniformly says exactly what I've been telling you here today, which is why this presentation is more broader than just telling you about judicial interviews. Um, so, I'm now going to give you, I had to figure out a way to convey to you that there is actually a very hopeful involvement of judges interacting with children. We've used this several times, and it works. And it's totally permitted under law, and it does not run afoul of anything I've said so far, anything you've heard at the conference, and it is also a robust solution. So, here's the background. All of the analysis in a typical case is static. This happened on this day. And believe me or not, who has better evidence? And what does it really mean in the broader context of the case? A much more robust analysis is a dynamic so imagine if we've all heard, you know, judges should stay with these families once they're identified right through the system to the end, and then they should stay at the end to seize themselves 
of the case even after a final adjudication to see if the remedy, whatever it is, work. Well, there is limited bandwidth in the formal programs that support the protective separation. We all know that. There's been five practitioners trained in aftercare in Canada for family purchase. Our friend Kathleen Ray is ill and her program is on hold. So we have lots of informal type programs, we have lots of programs designed to help families other than the most severe, but there's limited bandwidth for the remedy, the ultimate remedy that we're going to be discussing here at the conference. So as lawyers, we need to offer a robust solution, a solution that's actually going to work to all our families who can't access or can't afford the Call Family Bridges the Cadillac of, of programs. <coughs> Thankfully, we have a developing body of law on what happens after a structural intervention not involving the formal Family Bridges structure. And interestingly, it works there as well, in even the direst of cases. What does this intervention look like? And it's done to enable the judge to follow this through and make a dynamic analysis including the Indian children, it looks like this. So, just focus on that last point. You can make any sort of structural intervention in a family without sending the family off to one of these programs, so long as the incentives, consequences, messaging, and the practical application of those, right? Narcissists don't fear the theoretical application of law, but they can their behavior to the actual application of law if they're incentive enough. So we use what's called review orders. A review order under our law, even if at the final adjudication, imposing some sort of structural intervention is to be considered temporary because what you're doing in the short term is not what you envisage for the family for the longer term after it heals. The elements are here, and this is a permitted, even a recommended judicial meeting of the children. So it's not, I'm doing an investigation, I want to hear your views from you directly. The judge has made the decision. You have two competent parents, I'm going to help you fix this because you guys can't fix it themselves. This family, all members, including the children, tend to let the children get off scot-free in every case, not accountable for their own behavior. That's feeling number one in every single parent I've ever seen. It's not the child's fault. It's only the parent's fault. Wrong. Okay? Children can control their own behavior when we give them protected space. I'm going to show you the protected space. So the judge meets with the children to say, We've all let you down, including all the adults in your life have let you down, but it's okay. You have your whole life ahead of you, and we're going to fix this. So here's what's happening for the next six months, and then I'm going to see the whole family again in six months. So here's the decision that I've made. So don't blame either of your parents. Here's the decision I have made. Here's how it's going to work. Here's what I need you guys to do. And now we're going to have a little meeting. You guys, me, and mom. And then a meeting, you guys, me, and your dad. And we're going to talk it all through what everybody's going to do. And you're going to be seeing me again in six months. And I'm not your parents. I'm going to decide what's going to happen based on how everybody acts. So let's have that discussion now. Here's the expectations. And you guys are going to be accountable for that sort of behavior. And that's what I want to see. This will all work out great for everybody, and let's have that big home video moment. In one long litigated case that I've spent apparently half my life in Windsor, Ontario, which is across the border from Detroit over the last seven years, when the judge came into the room, all three little girls turned their chairs around to face the wall and demonstrate to the judge that they don't have to listen to him. That told the judge everything he needed to know 
about copying, about the parenting method, right? So what are the four tools of parenting in the World Digest, 135,000 books on Amazon, you'll learn guidance, boundaries, incentives, and consequences progressively applied until you get the appropriate behavior, healthy behavior from the children. Much better the children learn the consequences. Note, we never use the word punishment, it's pejorative. We never use the word discipline, it's pejorative. I mean, they're not, it's just semantics. We use the word consequence. And why is it important for children to learn consequences during childhood? Because they all get a big shock the first assignment they hand in the university. The professor doesn't care whether they've attended, no one's taking attendance, doesn't even care if you submitted it. All they care about is, do we have your money? That's it. And why do a whole bunch in a jurisdiction of A-level high school students do abysmally to first year university? It's a shock. Okay? So you set the expectations. There's a highly specific covenant pattern that hopefully time will allow me to show. And um, there's accountability for all participants. The judge stays involved with case management. And it enables a dynamic analysis of the family system in motion. And the, I'll call it a therapist, even though it's not therapy, the mental health practitioner who's going to shepherd this through has the ability to contact the court if they're achieving blocks or someone, someone usually the children are not participating in good faith. And the judge engineers it to the conclusion that the judge told the entire family. So it doesn't corrupt the adjudicated process. Here's my decision. Okay? I'm going to figure out what the final parental timeshare is when this heals. But I've heard, and I've thought, and I've adjudicated, and I'm going to judge everybody in terms of the final schedule. I'm, I'm moving it to this schedule, but only in the short term. And everybody's going to do what they're going to do, and then we're going to get to the, to the final, maybe 50-50. But I'm going to be judging everybody, and I'm going to stay in touch with you guys. That doesn't corrupt the adjudicated process. And it doesn't fall afoul. So one of the handouts is the law field therapy. It's ready on the the PSG website, some wonderful statements from judges that conventional therapy doesn't work. So instead of all of us lamenting here, why do judges keep doing time after time? Because they don't understand what therapy is. There are slides about this. <coughs> Let's show them the jurisprudence where other judges have said, it doesn't work, it can't work. It can't work without the aligned parent fully bought in. Without that, even the greatest therapist in the world can achieve nothing a direct quote from one of our noted cases. Okay, I, I mentioned the success of non-program related structural interventions. There's an increasing body of those. So I've included in the materials you're going to get a sample notice of motion, kind of seeking this of our own initiative on an interim basis to see if we can avoid a trial in a very, very difficult situation. I was sitting at the back and I got the email about how this weekend's access went, and of course, it didn't. The child never even exited the aligned parents home. So there's going to be a trial. But that trial will be informed by the failure of the aligned parent given that one last chance to remain the primary parent just want a healthy relationship for together. Here's a long list that you've accepted. Here's all the covenants that I'm about to show you guys. And couldn't get the child out of the house. And the first attempt, post, the judge was very happy that, uh, you know, we're there with a, with a construct that could work and endorsed it wholeheartedly. And at the first attempt, okay, so uh, the late Abba Ibn, uh, Israel's foreign minister, once famously said in a different context, and I'll, I'll pull all the phrase, in this context, alienators never miss an opportunity. To miss an opportunity to deny it. Okay, so this is the one last chance with directed therapy and covenants. The 
the covenant, you know, I come from a business law background, or my own journey had brought me here for you guys. Thankfully, it all ended well for me. So in the business law world, you have a 135-page loan agreement. The positive covenants are more important than the negative covenants. You will maintain a working capital ratio of X. You will do this and will do that and will do that to maintain the solidity of my security. The negative covenants, you won't grant any other security and you won't sell off any division without my consent and on and on. But the positive covenants in a business law sense are usually more important than the negative covenants. So too in family law. We have great difficulty absent the webcam in the alien parent's house really proving what's going on there and all the subtleties, all the subtle ways they can miss a tune and, and produce one of these children. But the positive covenants, it is your job to promote that other parent to the child and keep doing it till it sticks safe, loving, available, able to make a substantial contribution to the child's life, that you're in favor of this parenting schedule as well. And it goes on and on and on. It's about four pages of covenants. That's what's missing in any intervention in family law. Highly detailed, highly prescriptive covenant patterns. And thankfully in Canada, we even have cases saying that these types of families need Highly detailed, highly prescriptive parenting covenant patterns. Okay. Um, we also have a covenant pattern for the targeted parent. And I've heard from the other speakers here, we shouldn't judge them too harshly, we shouldn't force them to, we shouldn't re-victimize them, we shouldn't force them to apologize for stuff that didn't happen, we should understand that a lot of their maladaptive behaviors are reactive, and believe me, I can. It's not helpful, and it confuses judges. In my cases, I tell my targeted parent clients, you are expected to be perfect. Not that it's fair, not that anybody can be perfect all the time, but there's a famous expression, and I wish I could attribute it, I didn't invent it. We aim for perfection, knowing we can't be achieved anticipating landing on excellence, okay? That's what we need of our target parents. So, uh, I mentioned normative parenting, the science of normative parenting, there is a science of normative parenting, and these next couple of slides I'm not gonna go through, but suffice it to say you have all the reference materials that I'm speaking about. The PDFs are, are gonna be posted up website, they're all there. If anybody wants any of this in advance, I'm not smart, but I have a USB key here, you just read it off on your own computer. The slide deck goes on for about another 20 slides. I knew that, I just wanted a reference point for future reference on the voice of the child and 